My hearing's been dead. <laughs> well, I have one more. <laughs> Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, James Just, Lee Welter, and John Cameron. And the 2017 tax cut made Americans more flush and more charitable because they had more money to give to uh, Pacific Legal Foundation and other good causes. Right, John? Um, actually, true. Uh, slightly okay. more, uh, fewer donations for more dollars. So, um, you know, the, the, at least the, I haven't seen any study uh, late. The one I saw was, I think, February 19, maybe. So it should have taken into account the year end. So what people are doing, um, the standard deduction for a married couple went to $24,000. And uh, most folks um, in, in high tax states uh, in the past could deduct their uh, property taxes, which were high, and their personal income taxes, which were high, so that they would, because standard deductions weren't high, they would itemize. And then when they itemized, it made tax sense to do charitable deductions. But um, people who are on the edge, apparently since there, there are fewer, uh, fewer gifts in total but greater amounts, maybe didn't do that. But what's happening is that people are smart. So uh, there are uh, a couple of people I've talked to. I raise money for, for a living for Pacific Legal Foundation. So um, um, what people are doing is bunching. Uh, their um, their uh, charitable giving. So they'll time it based upon a year where it makes sense to itemize if they're on the edge. And then uh, folks who are, um, you know, it, there, there's a, most donors for any charitable organization in the country are 75 years old, 75 years old or older. Uh, Australia has gone after young donors, and I think their average age is still in the high 60s. So young people give, but they give unless they're the rare bird bazillionaire from, from Silicon Valley, people give when they're older. So uh, if they have money in their IRA, then um, there's a, a, a wonderful thing in the tax law that allows them to give directly from their IRA to a, a charitable organization. They don't get the charitable deduction, but it reduces their adjusted gross income. And so, um, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, they're going to be down, deductions are going to be down, gifts are going to be down because of um, changing the tax law, but, but uh, the evidence isn't there to support that. So, so this is kind of a, a, a bum rap on the tax law, is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and when you think about it, um, how many of us here give to charity? You mean like Pacific Legal Foundation? Yeah, yeah. Judicial Watch? Yeah. Uh, other organizations that protect us from government bureaucrats. Yeah. <laughs> um, how many of us work for one of those? Um, do you do it because of the tax deduction? No. Tax deductions no. don't make any difference for me, but um, I can make another point or two. Uh, yeah. Related. No, I, I think you should. Okay. Yeah. One is I recall reading not immediately, recently, but uh, in the past, that the party people who are registered to the very uh, party uh, of caring and concern and compassion give less than people who are uh, adherents of the other party, which is those nasty, selfish capitalists. Is, is that still the case? I do not know. I don't have that number. Okay. I'd, love, I'd love to and, say uh, Yeah, right. I've read the same empirical studies yeah. that you have. Republicans are more charitable than Democrats, yes. if you want to make it, put it in, in bold. So the fascists terms. are, the fascists if you want to be are really, more really, really charitable clear, than, the, than the socialists? Uh, those who, who, who claim compassion are claiming compassion on other people's giving. They're saying, you should give so I can feel good. Yeah. Whereas Republicans uh, generally, or conservatives generally, say, I will give so I will feel good. And of course, libertarians will say, uh, if you want to feel good, you should give. If you, you know, if that makes you feel good, if it doesn't make you feel good, don't give. But do what makes you feel good, whatever that might be. So yeah. there's, there's another point here, and I'm, oh, I'm, I, I hope I'm not go interrupting. Ahead. I'll, I'll make another um, one. Uh, a lot of charitable giving is given to faith-based organizations. On the, on the right, those are typically religious. On the left, they're ecological. So, um, you know, there's, there's a... You mean the government established religion? Yeah. Well, there's, and, you're, saying, you're saying that 
uh, environmental causes have a, a religious nature to them uh, psychologically. Well, they're they're they're, they're faith based. Uh, people are are um, you know people are the, the the massive audience, the thousands that are watching. I'm sure there are uh, some of you folks who who believe um, rabidly that uh, that all all the stuff that passes for science about climate change or global warming or whatever in the heck they're calling it today is is true but um you know basically from what from what i've seen uh the the uh, there's a faith element to that and and um so when you look at most charitable giving is given to faith-based organizations whether you want to call that one a faith-based or not but certainly religious organizations get get the bulk of charitable giving in this country. And then there are things like, um, you know, a very small percentage of charitable giving is given to uh, folks in this country who defend the Constitution that defends people's rights to do everything else, and the rest is given to organizations that try to take away those rights. So, um, uh, I haven't seen anything that, that uh, and indicates... Some given, and some is given to uh, uh, organizations that try to you know, help poor people. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, I'm not saying that, that, you know, and those are wonderful organizations, and a lot of them do a lot of good. I mean, you know, if you don't have anything, you're looking for safe drinking water, $20 a month will change your life. So uh, right. when I do my little gratitude journal in the morning, I, that's one of them. I'm safe grateful I never uh, wake in the morning with my... Th first thoughts being, where can I find safe drinking water? But Good that's point. about 10% of the population in the world. Uh, coming so, out of the faucet in Sacramento, uh, unfortunately. But, well, it's, uh, it's... You can purify it. Yeah, you can purify it. You, you run it through my refrigerator, and that gets out some of it, and then I put it through my filtered bottle, and that gets out the rest. And, you know, I'd, <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd much rather risk what comes out of the faucet in Sacramento than dysentery and, uh, and no question all the of rest it. of that. Yeah. So I think, I think it's bogus. Uh, people aren't, haven't figured it out unless they're finance professionals or go to somebody who really understands the tax code that, you know, if, if, uh, if you were itemizing before, if you bunch your deductions like every other year and you're on the border, you should still be able to take it. So you're going to probably see more swings in charitable giving at the, the, the lower to mid level than you did in the past. But there's no evidence that I've seen. Uh, it's the last number I saw of charitable giving was up 4.9%. So would it be fair to say that charitable giving is motivated by charitable feelings um, primarily? One would hope. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have you mentioned... Before you move on, a, a question related to that. My view is that the Internal Revenue Service and the income tax is more wasteful and corrupt than any money gathering scheme could be. And I favor replacing it with a retail sales tax called the fair tax, which has a lot of pluses. One reason the compliance cost for the current tax system is hundreds of billions of dollars a year. It's wasted, essentially. Now, if we made a switch there and charitable deductions weren't a part of the picture, Think people would still donate? Apparently so. Yeah. No, I, I, people are motivated. If if there's a benefit to giving in a certain way that reduces your taxes, people are going to take it. But they're not going to give just for the tax purposes. I mean, yeah, I'm sure there are some percentage that do, and I'm sure there's studies out there that I haven't read that say it. But 4.9% uh, up, the number of donation, the number of donors slightly down, the amount slightly up. But then with the aging population, you would figure that there's more people who um, have assets to give late in life. Old people got all the money. So. Well, speaking as a representative of a, a public interest uh, law firm, which operates as a 401c3 uh, charitable organization, tell us a little bit about uh, one of the cases you're working with, the uh, Joe Robertson case who was imprisoned for building ponds to stop forest fires? Is that, right. is that Joe, the correct Joe answer? Joe Robertson uh, was 78 when he was in prison for 18 months. He was a 78-year-old Navy veteran. He had a uh, water truck business uh, that was used to help firefighters. And uh, he basically lives so far away that his widow, he's since had a stroke and died. Uh, and many people will say that 18 months in prison didn't help. Uh, didn't help. I don't know anybody whose health has improved. Well, I take that back. There's some people who get some free dental work in prison. But, and get um, buffed up. 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, even, strong, even that's changed it. now. They don't let them uh, get extra protein. They don't let them lift weights. You no longer have super athletes coming out of prison. But there, there, you can certainly get fit in prison. So, uh, <clears throat> Joe um, looked at the efficiencies of firefighting mechanisms in the Montana woods where he lived, and decided that uh, if a fire came. He wasn't going to be able to rely on the three fire hose trickle of water running through, I don't know what you want to call it, uh, the property, that um, he would have to have a pond in order to get in enough water uh, that he could effectively fight fire where it was. Um, this is to keep him house, his house from his, his house and his land and all the rest of that. So, uh, you know, there's some question about what were the ponds on his land and all the rest of that. But the um, um, the powers that be one of the regulatory agencies, and I knew this three minutes ago, and it's just whoosh, right out of my head. I think it's there the are Army, too many of those Army agencies. Corps of, yeah. EPA, and, Army Corps of Engineers. Yeah, Army Corps of Engineers. Um, decided that uh, he had um, uh, dumped into a water of the United States, well, the navigable water. And, and, the, the, um, and this was a, a, a body of water, moving body of water, that uh, had the same water volume as three garden hoses. But somehow, due to the, the uh, nefarious machinations, uh, the slick obfuscation and facile BS of the regulatory agencies, they've managed to turn the, the uh, Clean Water Act, which, which addressed navigable waters, uh, into something that basically covers anything they want it to. The, the, the terms of their own rules are so fuzzy and interpreted in so many ways that you don't know what you're in violation of. A very blunt weapon. <laughs> yes, and so they decided that when he built these ponds and uh, the, the, the dirt that he moved to build them somehow interfered with this navigable water, although I don't know what's going to navigate on something that's three fire hoses, or three not fire hoses, garden hoses. Um, and uh, they decided to uh, imprison him for uh, his criminal act. And, and here's a little side note. Uh, the only reason there was any complaint is that one of his neighbors had one of these ponds on her land, and the, uh, the, the uh, government uh, thugs threatened or extorted her into filing a criminal complaint against Joe with the threat that she would be prosecuted for uh, a violation of the Clean Water Act if she did not do so. Now we know where the mafia is going. Yeah. Well, no, no. See, the mafia would protect you from the yakuza and the tong, but <laughs> the, the so they have moral a moral code. But these people is like a they're like a, a feeding frenzy of vultures. They don't care who picks over the carcass because there's another carcass right down the road. So. Um, we asked the uh, Pacific Legal Foundation, asked uh, the Supreme Court to take a look at this mess. Uh, and uh, after he got out of prison, and we, we got the Supreme Court to take a look at it, and then Joe died of a stroke. So right now, uh, the, they're, they're still working out the terms of agreement, and I'm not, I'm not going to go into the details of it because I don't want you know, the one billionth no, of a that. percent chance that, that what I say will somehow uh, affect the outcome, but it looks like the, his sentence has been commuted or, or overturned. So the $130,000 they want from his estate um, to fix the, the problem of the ponds, apparently it costs $130,000 to clean a ditch uh, and backfill ponds somehow. I'll do it for like twenty five and and make the charitable deduction to his family. Um, so they're going after, or were going after his his widow for the money, uh, to uh, for restitution to fix this horrible uh, nightmare. Restitution uh, on your own yeah, land. Yeah. Restitution. Well, it's who knows. Some of the land supposedly in national parks. Some of it his. Some of it in neighbors. I would think people would be thankful that he created these little ponds so that if there's a fire, there's enough water for the fire trucks to put it out. But this is the kind of stuff that goes on um, just all the time. The saddest um, aspect of this is that our resources are using to persecute and extort us. Yeah. And there's uh, no personal accountability in the people that, that are responsible. I mean, they're, 
they're managing this whole project no, in some no. way. I keep hearing you can't fire those people, and I. We can find. Can you take them to court? No, well, yeah. not with. And you, you can't no. take them to court. Not the individuals, no. That's qualified they have immunity. Or qualified something. immunity. Yeah. Well, there is a criminal movement. indemnification. Huh? <laughs> there is a movement afoot because there's nothing in in U.S. law uh, that originally in the Constitution. The idea of qualified immunity is a is a very new idea in this country, and the people who who uh, are basically. Uh, the most protected by it are those who don't really need the protection. I mean, uh, you see cops suit all the time, civilly and all the rest of that. But DA, can't touch them. Except for one did uh, did go to jail for two weeks in New York for uh, falsifying evidence that sent somebody to prison for 17 years. So he was thoroughly punished for that. So, but there is a movement afoot to look at this whole idea of qualified immunity and really make an attack on it. And uh, people are doing studies, think tanks are getting together, cases are being brought. It's going to take a while. But, you know, back to this, Pacific Legal Foundation had a landmark case in 1987 called Nolan uh, v. California um, Coastal Commission, or as I call them, the Communist Coastal Commission. And they would basically extort land out of people to, to give them a permit to build or modify their homes as if they were in a coastal zone, which is getting bigger. And um, Pacific Legal Foundation basically created law that stopped that extortion. And that one case has been uh, cited uh, in other cases 6,237 times. So that lets you know how much extortion goes on. And if, they, if, if attorneys, let's say, <coughs> Just 20% uh, of those cases are actual direct representative, direct representation cases. That's about 1,200. So if 1,200 cases need to quote that law to stop extortion, add the factor of 10 onto that for people who couldn't afford the attorney to take the law. So my guess is government agencies, bodies are, are doing this kind of extortion to the tune of since 1987, 100,000 times, which is frightening. We're paying people, it's like you said, awful. to extort yes. us. And I'm sorry I went off on this, Richard, but it's a no, no, it's a horrible it's, thing. It's it is a horrible definitely, thing. and it's reminiscent of the John Rapano's case. In fact, uh, well, that's another mind. Pacific Pac Legal Pac Foundation. Pacific Legal has an excellent record at the Supreme Court. And really, with, tell us all about that. No, I'm well, sorry. This, and, 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 I, this shouldn't it, be. It, this shouldn't be a, a commercial be for a nonprofit. Better. Well, we're hoping. Keep your fingers crossed for Nick V. Uh, Township of Scott. I'm sorry, Richard. I got sorry. I got <laughs> sidetracked here. Here's a quote for you. It is easier to encrypt information than to decrypt it. The universe believes in e e encryption. James, who said that and why? Well, that's uh, the Julia Assange, of course, would say something like that. And while well, we get his point, I don't think the universe actually cares one way or another. But I care about encryption. So, you know, we all do as part of our personal privacy, encryption, the right to protect our own data, even if it's meaningless data, just a love letter to me and my, you know, to me and my, my wife. It's those, that's my personal private data. If I want to encrypt it, I should be allowed to. And no one else should be able to in, break that encryption unless I want them to. And Absolutely. I actually, actually, may I say something? The, the, the views I express on the show are not those of Pacific Legal Foundation, um, that we don't use the word extortion, um, things like that. So uh, uh, please. Sorry, that was my, I, I No, I it's, it's that. mine as well. This is my, my personal feeling, and I can't think of another word that would fit other than extortion. When you threaten somebody with, you know, a criminal prosecution unless they rat somebody out, that's, you know. That's that's uh, well, it's immoral that's, if those it's are, not those extortion. Are, those are those are what's that? It's immoral. Whether you whatever. Anyway, those those are, those are my words, folks. Not not the organization that I work for. Well, the case of Julian Assange is getting more and more interesting all along. I mean, he was originally the person who the Democrats hated because he was digging up uh, information on the uh, Hillary Clinton campaign, which uh, was being fed one way or another uh, through the Russians, if you believe that the Russians, if you believe that story, or uh, through other channels. Do, uh, who knows? Uh, but in one way or another, it got into the public uh, discourse, and Trump used it very effectively to uh, run against Hillary Clinton, uh, basically. Well, we have to remember, Democrats loved Julian Assange when he exposed George Bush. 
Yeah, they, yes, they yeah, loved they, him. They loved him when he exposed when he ex Democrats loved him when he exposed Bush. Republicans, Republicans loved him when he exposed Hillary. Hillary Clinton. And, now, and now they both hate him. And now, the guy that benefited the most from uh, from Julian Assange, Donald J. Trump, yes. is throwing the book at him. They're oh. actually. Uh, bringing up the, I think it's a, a World War One statute on on uh, on uh, criminal behavior, yeah, making, up make, making criminal criminal criminalizing anything uh, that that is uh, can, can be you know can be uh, conceived as anti-American. So even think, though yeah. Donald Trump is a far better candidate than uh, was Hillary Clinton, we'd all be better off with a libertarian in that role, wouldn't we? Well, what surprises me is that there are news media who has been proclaiming how much of a danger Trump is to journalists since before he was elected is now essentially silence on what he's doing to Julian Assange. It's shocking. Well, they don't consider him a real, we, we talked about this on one, one of the other shows, there were quotes from uh, some lamestream media journalists, if you can call them that, and you shouldn't anymore, who said that he doesn't deserve the same protection as real journalists. Well, yeah, and that's journalism trying to set up a, a medieval guild. I mean, we've yes. got, we've yeah. got that's privilege. all it is. They're just saying, if you're not in our guild, you don't get to have freedom of the press. We guild members, we can say whatever we want. You who are outside the guild can't say a damn thing. That's, yeah, that's what we that forgot the freedom of the press was literally freedom of freedom the press. Of to the reproduce, press, freedom reproduce of your speech. ideas and to distribute them. Not, re not freedom of what we now call the press as you know, a corporate news guzzling organization. Right? <laughs> the, it's not the same thing. The press was literally Benjamin Franklin's press. You could, you know, you take in your little pamphlet, you say, reproduce a hundred of these things to me, and then you go off onto the street and you pass them out. That was the freedom of the press. Huh, sounds like the internet. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Which and so we've forgotten that that's what the freedom of the press is. So it's let's not all, the freedom let's of all, news gathering let's organizations. Let's all just fly away, leave the country, become expatriate, expatriates, okay? <laughs> only, problem is, only problem is that they are now introducing a 23-inch airline seat. I don't think I could fit into that to get out of the country. <laughs> At the well, Paris Air Show, 23-inch. Yeah, go ahead. Not everybody is large that they need more than is currently available. It brings to mind once flying from uh, Florida to uh, back to Michigan via Atlanta. You always have to stop in Atlanta when you're making those East Coast flights. Uh, somebody had put their briefcase and their jacket on one of, or two of three seats toward the back of the plane. And I told my wife, I says, oh, nobody needs that much room. I'll just move the jacket over next to the briefcase and the two of us can sit here. And then the man who had taken the first leg of the flight from New Orleans to Atlanta came in. He was about six foot seven and 280 pounds. Mm -hmm. He did need two seats, but we got along all right. It worked out okay. Did he pay but, for two seats? But regardless, no, he deserved it. Regardless, it's best to get up and move around, wiggle around in place if nothing else, but move while you're on a long flight. Uh, Blood clots and pulmonary emboli are, can be deadly. They really are. It's uh, just sit there immobile. But sitting on a 23-inch bicycle seat while you're flying a, on a 10-hour flight does that make any sense? Well, Other than to the airlines who are going to be day. able to monetize their uh, cubic square well, feet. Well, who knows? It more? could be ergonomically <coughs> better than the the British Airways seat that I sat in for 10 hours. You know, or as I like to call it, the uh, future spinal surgery uh, tool. I don't know, maybe those seats are designed by uh, back surgeons. But, <laughs> but regardless, it's appropriate to get um, either wiggle around in place or get up and move around a little bit. Well, so, so now all 289 people on the airline are marching up and down the aisles. I wonder how long that's going to, uh, how long it'll take to get the, to get the uh, flight attendant's attention if you do that. Well, they as long as they're like not all on seats. one side, the same side of the airplane, saying, "Look at that!" <laughs> uh, the uh, the our, our esteemed president has tweeted once again. This tweet said that he's going to deport millions. I. You know, that's what he said. No, no Hyperbole quote, unquote, is his second millions, language. Millions of, migrant, language. millions of migrants. Uh, huh? Well, I, he, he, he likes to stretch things a little bit. It doesn't mean they're outright like lies, but they're exaggerations. <laughs> so, so, I mean, there's only, what, tw uh, tw I don't know, 12 million, 9 million, something like that, immigrants yeah, it, in the United States. It's logistically it's impossible. Illegal immigrants. 
illegal, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, it's logistically impossible. I mean, even if we could do it, it'd just be so expensive and logistically impossible. So it's, it's like Lee says, he speaks in hyperbole. He, it's, 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 it's campaign season. This is all just food for fodder. It's not, it, I don't even pay attention to this kind of stuff. They're yakking to their base, and they're going to tell them whatever. We're going to free everything. We were get, he also said he was going to, what, cure is going to not just cure cancer, but cure AIDS, he said the other day. So, you know, they're just kind of spewing stuff out the... Well, see, I, and I don't. I, I see no reason why this thing shouldn't be cured. The same guys that are designing pot that these kids are smoking now, because it's like something. From what I hear, it's uh, it, you know been genetically altered to such an extent that it's like something. Put that science and aim it at AIDS. Just say whoever comes up with the cure is going to get a little ten billion dollar tax free check from the United States government. Uh, and you can you can patent it and market the heck out of it, and we're not going to get in the way of the profit motive. In about a week, somebody will you know it won't it won't happen in a week with the FDA. It would take twenty years, but I don't know why there hasn't been a cure now. I mean, were the costs of that disease so? Well, I'm not saying not, Trump's going to do it. I think he it's didn't just too invent many the internet either, the, did he? Well, that just getting getting thing. back to the reality of yeah. immigrating millions. Yeah, it's just not ICE possible. has been working their tail off, uh, importing as many people as they can move through the system, which amounts to about seven thousand per month. Yeah, so you're talking not eighty-five thousand a year. So it's not even a hundred thousand a year we can do now, and he wants to do a million over what ten years. I think the appropriate role of border control is to screen out the criminals. If that's at all possible, it's not. It's not possible to take the criminals it's out. It's not. It's hard to keep them out of the government too, isn't it? It's impossible. Okay, and <laughs> it's impossible to keep drugs out of prisons. What are you talking about, keeping criminals out of the country? Oh, no, that's another subject, but I can't disagree with that. And also, minimizing diseases. Suddenly, that might be we, possible. We have a we have a bunch of uh, newcomers, let's call them, visiting Disneyland. Of course, what could be more American than visiting Disneyland? And suddenly, there's an outbreak of measles. Uh, or whooping whooping go off or TB. I mean, yeah, there, you got it. There, there, there are, you know, there, there are. I mean, that's something you can check be, fairly easily. You can, you can do a fairly easy medical check to see if people have infectious diseases, and if so, quarantine them, quarantine them until they're they're cured. That's and then let them in. That's what we did in the Ellis Island era. We actually have a blueprint that we can follow. We can yeah. just go back in history, look at the Ellis Island era. They did it in like three days. They would get the immigrants out of the out of the system, and like and if they had days. an incurable disease, they sent them back. Yeah, and it was like two percent of the popula of the people who went to Ellis Island were rejected. It was like 2%. 98% of the people were sent through within like three days, if and I remember their, my... their forebears are now in Congress, is that... Uh, yeah, and no. so now we've got these, these, these their people forebears are my sitting out there for months yes. much because we can't process that, them properly. Then there yes. are people that came before that, that came in uh, the 15th century and the 16th century. Yeah, just century walked up on the beach. It's that, that, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they, 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 they these are the people that built the country, right? Or they took a kayak across the Aleutian Strait, but, or the, uh, uh, the uh, Bering Strait. Yeah. Yeah. Thor Heyerdahl, huh? Or at, at, no, at one time, <laughs> suppose, yeah, they might have been able to walk across. Could so, be. Could yeah. be. Could have been frozen. Yeah. There, 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 are no, there, there are no more Native immigrants. Americans. There are more immigrants coming to the United States, or from the United States to Mexico, than Mexicans coming to the United States. And that's my, that's my, that's my comment on immigration. Think about why that is fact. More people expatriating to Mexico than Mexicans coming to the U.S. That's the show. We'll see you again next week. Same time, same place on the Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you very much, Richard. Thanks. Very well done. That, that show went quick. It sure did. Definitely. Yeah.